Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ann Kim, and I'm a contributing editor at the Washington Monthly Magazine. And I have the honor of moderating this highly distinguished panel this morning. So I think what we just heard from Steve Case is a little bit more testimony about the urgency of the challenge that regional divergence is posing to the nation. As Mark mentioned this morning, it's a phenomenon that is literally pulling the country apart. Um, we also heard, I think, we saw a glimmer of hope here. Maybe regional divergence is inevitable, but it certainly is not irreversible. Uh, and what this panel, the purpose of this panel is going to continue on this vein of solutions. What can we do? You know, how do we bring prosperity to the places that have been left behind? And can we get a galaxy of superstar cities throughout the country so that all of us, in fact, do rise? So the full bios for the panel are in your handouts, so I'm going to make the introductions very brief. Uh, to my left is Tim Bartik. He is the senior economist for the W.E. Upjohn Institute based out of Kalamazoo, Michigan. To his left is, Pam Lu, um, is Anthony Hood. Sorry, he was the director of civic innovation in the office of the president at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. To his left is Pam Lewis. She is the executive director of the New Economy Initiative in Detroit, Michigan, and rounding out the panel is Rob Atkinson, who is the founder and president of the Information uh, Technology and Innovation Foundation and the co-author of the paper with Mark Miro, of the paper that is at the centerpiece of today's event. So, Mar uh, Rob, if we can actually start with you. Uh, the paper that you have co-authored with Mark lays out what I think is a pretty bold proposal for anti-divergence. If you could give us an overview of what you propose and talk a little bit about why it's necessary to go as big as you do. Sure. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Anne. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the title of the report that Mark and I did is called The Case for Growth Centers, How to Spread Innovation Across America. And I think it's important to be specific about what we're talking about. We're talking about spreading innovation across America. We're not talking about spreading economic opportunity writ large across America. Those are very separate things. They're separate things because the innovation economy is essentially an agglomeration economy. And you cannot like that. You can wish it's not the case, but it is the case. Innovation jobs agglomerate or what, what regional economists call a cluster. And they do that because they're based upon innovation and knowledge, and you need that interchange. Even in the world today with the internet and Skype and all that, you need that local interchange. And so when Steve Case talks about all these Silicon Valley companies with a second office strategy, that's right. But you have to understand that second office strategy is not going to some place with 3,000 workers. Hey, I can pay my software engineer $30,000 a year. Well, you can't get a software engineer there. So unfortunately, what's happened is that the second office strategy all too often today is overseas. So these companies will say, where do I want to go? Well, I'm going to go to Shanghai. It's going to save me a bunch of money. Or I might go to Tel Aviv. Or I might go to Bangalore. Or I might go to Taipei. And so increasingly, what you're seeing is tech companies going overseas because they need to save money. Now, the real question, I think, is could they come here and save money? So for example, uh, Taipei is uh, cost 16% less than Austin, uh, but Indianapolis is almost as cheap as Taipei. Uh, Shanghai is 35% cheaper than Boston, but Detroit is equally as cheap. So if you go to Shanghai or Detroit, you're, you're basically, there's no cost differential. So why don't the companies go to these places? I think you saw that with um, the Amazon HQ decision. There were, I don't know how many companies, how many places were competing for that. I mean, it was like everybody, all of them. All of them. <laughs> like, like, you know, I have 300 people, I, I want HQ2. Uh, the reality was Amazon HQ2 was never going to go to most of those places in a million years. It, why did it pick New York and Washington? Because it was a safe choice. It was like that joke or that statement, nobody ever got fired for hiring IBM. If you're a location consultant, you don't get fired by choosing New York or Washington, because if you come here, the worst that can happen is you've got to pay a little bit more, but you get everything you need. You get great air, air hub, you get good universities, and you've got a great talent base and, and the like. So our essentially key point, and it's really simple, 
is if we want to spread technology opportunity around the country, we're going to have to focus on concentrating it. We're going to have to find a few places that have some potential. So it's a little bit like the Goldilocks strategy. We, we don't want to help the places that already are doing great. You know, San Diego, Boston, C Seattle, Silicon Valley, they're on autopilot. You know, they're doing some things locally. They don't need to do anything locally other than fix their roads and transit and get some affordable housing. They're on autopilot. They're just going to keep going. But there's a bunch of places around the country that we highlighted in the report where we said these places could be that. They have some of the ingredients. They have good research universities. They already have some tech jobs. They've got some startups, maybe related to what Steve's been doing. They're almost there. So how do we get them over the, over the hump, if you will? And what we're proposing, essentially, is a federal initiative, which we believe has to be top-down, has to be federal, because to get these places over the hump, you have to put a lot of resources in for a longer period of time. It can't be a $25 million EDA regional innovation program that gets spread to 20 places and each gets half a, half a million dollars. It's just not going to do it. So we propose this competition. Places would compete. They would be eligible on the basis of things like, hey, we have skin in the game. We're going to put real money into this. We're going to f improve our community colleges. We're going to fix our infrastructure. We're going to have smart cities, whatever it takes. And then if you win, ideally you'd win 8 to 12 places. If you win, the federal government would commit to a set of policies and in programs and incentives for a 10-year period that would help you then become self-sustaining at the end of that. The core ingredient of that for us is research spending at universities. Uh, we propose essentially a $100 billion package over 10 years. Um, but there's another component, which is, um, so there's research spending, there's the tax incentives for R&D, there's uh, the federal land issues, a whole set panoply of federal programs and initiatives that could help these places. But there's really two important parts of that, and then I'll just stop. One is just simply the fact that we're designating places. Because when you're an Amazon or you're an Intel or a Microsoft and you're, a, you're in charge of location and you're going, where should I go? What you really want to know is you want to be able to go to a place where, number one, the local community understands and is committed to it, and number two, that you're not going to be the only one there. And if the federal government, through a competition, can say, hey, these are the eight or 10 or 12 places that are really we're going to focus on, it sends a very clear message to industry. Yeah, these are the places we can focus on. So our belief is that if we were to do this program, uh, that after 10 years, uh, we would probably see, if we, did, if we picked 10, we'd probably see seven that are outstanding successes that could really be self-sustaining. Uh, and I just close by saying, I, Mark and I totally get that that's not helping every place in the country. Totally get that. But I think the reality is it's just, it, it really is a myth that we can sort of spread technology out everywhere. When I got my PhD in Chapel Hill and was focusing on high-tech development, the state was focused on how can we get more RTP out to the eastern shore? And the answer was you can't. Just, you know, I'm sorry, you can't. I wish you could, but you can't. There's other things you can do for those places. So I think in our sort of narrow focus on how do we get more of the innovation tech economy to more places, that's what Mark and I are proposing. Tim, what do you make of this proposal that Rob has put on the table? And what would you add to it to widen the impact it's going to have and ensure that as many places around the country do benefit? Well, I guess my perspective is that broadening high tech beyond Silicon Valley is certainly a worthy goal. I'm certainly supportive of it, but I think that we need to go broader and help more distressed areas. And I would argue that for both substantive reasons and political reasons. Maybe we can get into politics later, but the, the substantive argument is we have many communities in this country really most small and medium-sized communities, many rural communities that have low employment to population ratios. They simply don't have enough jobs for all the population. They certainly don't have enough good jobs. And a high-tech strategy, as was already mentioned, will not help a lot of these areas. So you need something broader. Now, you know, one perspective is there's nothing you can do for these areas. I don't think that's true. 
I think there are proven job creation strategies that can work. You can look at business advice programs like manufacturing extension services that work with small and medium-sized manufacturers and try to give them advice on how to diversify their markets, how to be more competitive. You can look at customized job training programs where you have a community college, work with uh, area companies to try to provide the skills training that really is needed to upgrade their workforce and make them more competitive in the global economy. You have infrastructure programs that can strengthen areas. You have land development programs that can make more sites available for business development, whether that's due to brownfield redevelopment or you're developing business parks, research parks, industrial parks, that kind of thing. Those are all proven job creation strategies. Now, you might say, why doesn't this happen already? And certainly in some cases, I mean, we need, we need strong local leadership. We need local leadership that was mentioned getting beyond silos. Uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily have the optimal government structure in this country in the way local governments are structured. They're not structured around metro areas, for example. Uh, but another part is simply resources. There's a vicious cycle where areas that are left behind that have low employment to population ratios also don't necessarily have the resources to really invest in infrastructure and in business services and job training and the things that will turn their local economy around, will increase employment to population ratios, which, by the way, is not only a benefit for those areas, it's a benefit for the U.S. economy. This is, this is not simply a social or moral issue or equity issue of helping areas left behind. It's also an issue of are we in this country fully utilizing our workforce all over the country. We have people who lack jobs, lack good jobs, who could be employed and could be in better jobs, and we're not doing it. And that has implications for the overall productivity of the U.S. economy. So I think there is a rationale, since these areas lack resources, the vicious cycle was referred to before of underdevelopment, where they don't have the resources to invest, for the federal government provide, intervening in the right way to help. And by right way, I mean too frequently, the federal intervention in many areas is a one-size-fits-all um, mentality. And this is, one, this is clearly a situation where that does not work. Not every local area needs the same thing to be revitalized. Some areas can do a high-tech strategy. Some areas need infrastructure. Some areas need job training. Some areas have a manufacturing base that could benefit from manufacturing extension. Some areas do not. So the notion that we can have one magic federal program that is a highly uh, uh, targeted thing that just does one single, one-size-fits-all solution is a mistake. I think the federal intervention needs to be more of a block grant approach. It needs to be very flexible. It needs to have a wide range of, uh, of, of possible uses. And it needs to be done on a sustained basis. Um, now, have we ever done that before? I, mean, I think we, we have occasionally. Things like TVA in the you know, 1930s and on, I think, made a big difference. But it is not easy to do. It is hard for the federal government to do this kind of geographic targeting and hard to do it in a flexible way. But if we want to really bring help the struggling places of all types, not just the areas that can have a tech solution, we will need to adopt some such strategy that invests in a wide variety of infrastructure, business services, and job training for a lot of areas. And to me, that makes more substantive sense, and maybe we can get later on why it makes more political sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to stay on this thread of what inclusive growth could look like um, and want to widen the conversation, but also just want to go to you, Anthony. Um, Birmingham, Alabama is a place that has made an intentional effort to make inclusive growth a priority, and the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where you work, has been central to that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Birmingham's story over the last few years, and in particular, how has the university's involvement really affected the trajectory of the city? Sure. Uh, good morning. 
Uh, so uh, I'm in the city of Birmingham, uh, a city that we call Magic City. Uh, it's called the Magic City because it seems like the city just kind of came out of nowhere because of the intersection of the railroads back in the late 1800s. And we just so happen to have all the ingredients to make steel and coal. So it is a city that really grew up because of the steel industry. Uh, and so we enjoyed a lot of growth uh, over the early 1900s. Uh, but then as the steel and coal industry began to decline, that ironically was at the same time where the healthcare sector started to increase. So that's where University of Alabama Birmingham's prom uh, prominence uh, began to evolve. Ironically, our university is only 50 years old, yet this past year we just topped $600 million in R&D funding, uh, primarily from the NIH. And so at our university, we are really focused on taking those research dollars and turning that into opportunity for those in our region as well as those in our state. A large percentage of our population are Alabamians. Uh, a lot of them are first-generation students. And so we're giving opportunities to those uh, students. We have partnerships with HBCUs where we have summer programs where HBCU students come, train in a laboratory of a scientist or researcher at UAB, and then progress into medical school and things like that. We're also very involved in our startup tech ecosystem. Uh, we have an innovation uh, uh, incubator called Innovation Depot, which is one of the top incubators uh, in the nation. And so it's right uh, abuts our, our campus, and that provides opportunities to really get people involved in the tech entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, here recently we had a, a large buyout of one of our homegrown startups, a grocery delivery company called Shipped. I don't know if any of you uh, use Ship right now, but Ship was acquired by Target uh, two years ago for $550 million. That was huge for our community because I think it sent a signal not only externally that there's tech entrepreneurship going on in Birmingham, but I think it also helped our own personal identity to say, wow, we can do this. And if we have one ship, can we produce two, two three, four uh, more ships? I think one of the interesting things that came out of the ship story is that now SHIP is now intentionally doing a second office strategy. We have an initiative called Birmingham Bound, where essentially we uh, do a 36-hour tour of Birmingham. So we're attracting the high-tech, high-growth startups that are on the coast. We bring them to Birmingham, and we give them the southern hospitality. <laughs> we take them to the breweries. We give them barbecue. We give them bourbon. We give them all the, the trappings uh, of southern hospitality. But we also show them how very quickly, if you want to start up an office here with three, four, five, seven people. We have Space and Innovation Depot. We have housing. It is affordable. And we've been pretty successful the past year of encouraging startups to open that second office in Birmingham. Now, our thesis is, if we can get part of your company, we can get the whole thing after a while. Uh, so it's a stealth strategy to try to, 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 try to grow and recruit uh, these tech startups to come in. I would say lastly, some of the other things that we've done. Uh, a couple of years ago, we commissioned a study and we found that we had a, over 5,000 uh, tech job openings that were going unfilled in our community. Uh, and that's another thing that we learned through the Birmingham Bound Initiative is that the startups that are thinking about moving to Birmingham, one of their top concerns is, where's the talent going to come from? Uh, thankfully, we have a lot of universities in and around Birmingham. State of Alabama has the largest number of HBCUs uh, in our state, uh, in the country. So we have the talent there. We need, need to make sure that we're equipping that talent with the tech skills that they need for uh, the, the needs of startup companies. So we got a Department of Labor grant a few years ago. It was a $6 million grant. We're using that now to have tech boot camps where we're teaching software engineering, where it's a 14-week boot camp. Now these students can graduate from that boot camp and go directly into a job, start up a company, or they can use that as a pipeline into our two-year and four-year system. So we're doing software engineering, we have data analytics boot camps, and we also offer scholarships for those students that want to go to our two-year, four-year colleges in the Birmingham area and major in uh, tech. So all of that is supported by uh, UAB, as well as our partnerships with our corporate community. Uh, in our mayor's office, we, we're fortunate to have a very young mayor, Mayor Randall Woodfin, that was elected a couple years ago. And I think he's brought really a lot of energy, but also to what Steve said, partnerships. And making sure that the university is at the center of the partnerships between the corporate community, our elected officials, uh, and our nonprofit organizations. I would say the last thing I want to tee up is that we were very fortunate to have Rise of the Rest come to Birmingham, uh, uh, I guess last year. Um, and one of our startups, Mixtros, was uh, fortunate to get an investment from uh, Rise of the Rest. 
Uh, the founders of Mixed Trolls are Ashley Ammons and Carrie Schrader. It's a mother and daughter team that actually we recruited from Nashville uh, to come to one of our accelerator programs that's supported uh, by UAB. Uh, and after their investment from Rise of the Rest, they became the, only the 37th and the 38th African-American females to ever raise a million dollars for a startup, which is awesome, right? And discouraging at the same time. <laughs> um, only the 37th and the 38th. Um, and so I, I think that another thing that lifts up the opportunity that we have to make sure that we are driving investment and inclusive economic growth outside of the coast in places like Birmingham and other places similar to Birmingham and having that university at the center of those ecosystems. Pam, um, we have a lot of discussion about federal money on the table, both from Rob and um, from Tim, and some discussion about how universities can be involved in communities. But philanthropy clearly has a major role to play here. And, and as a strategic grant maker in the Detroit area, how do you see philanthropy playing a part in this question of inclusive and broad-based growth? Yeah, thanks for the question. And I have to back up a little bit because it hit me, Mark, this whole conversation around regional divergence. Det Southeast Michigan has been a microcosm of that. If you think about Detroit sitting in the center, surrounded by Ann Arbor, Oakland County, et cetera, the automotive industry dispersing itself into the suburbs. And the phenomenon of people being left behind is not new. <laughs> um, you know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of African-American, black and brown people across the country have been left behind, even in those cities that are thriving. And in Detroit, it's been fascinating to see this whole notion of how do you take catalytic dollars and try to activate a new culture around innovation and entrepreneurship, which is what philanthropy decided to do 12 years ago. And the project that I run called the New Economy Initiative has been the catalyst for, by which that happens. And so it was actually $100 million pulled together at that time. And our whole focus of Ford Foundation, uh, Knight Foundation, Kellogg, and others. And the whole focus was about how can we, as philanthropy, activate and reinvigorate this culture of entrepreneurship that we think the people of the city of Detroit forgot they had, right? It's not that they never had it. I mean, this is the, this is the community that put the world on wheels. This is the community that put universal music in our ears through Motown. And so the point was, let us invest in things that not necessarily are already, ha in addition to things that are already happening, like adding grant dollars to Wayne State University's technology commercialization pro program, or catalyzing a technology commercialization program within the Henry Ford Health System, the hospital. But also, how can we activate new programming so that anyone with an idea and a motivation to start and grow business can do so? We also learned that relying just on tech wasn't enough. I mean, Tim is exactly right, particularly if inclusion matters to you. But there's a tricky thing. When you're talking about entrepreneurship and tech and inclusion, you have to make sure that you're creating accessible points of entry and accessible capital and capital readiness for women and people of color that are pursuing that. Don't count them out of that side of it. But at the same time, you have to consider small business, small business growth, and who are going to be the employers of the majority of the residents in a city like Detroit. And so we decided to do both things. And I think the fascinating thing about philanthropy's role is that we could provide a lot of capital to things that could take higher risk than the commercial banks were going to do, uh, that could, sorry, that could provide lower rungs on the ladder to capital that small businesses need. SBA, they deliver small lending to small businesses, but if you look at the data, a lot of those, those loans are so large that a typical small business, it could crush them. And 90% of those loans are going to white founders. So even the government dollars flowing through, there needs to be someone on the ground to really insist that there's more intentionality around how you make that act accessible to women, immigrants, and people of color. So I have a lot of opinions on this, but, um, but it, it hit me though. Detroit is this microcosm and it was philanthropic dollars that invested in place because we invested in things that people could point to co-working spaces, Tech Town, one of the largest um, uh, incubator accelerator spaces in Detroit, where now is a community of hub where you have tech, growth, small businesses, nonprofits, students coming through there. 
we invested in CDFIs. So you can't necessarily rely on commercial banks, but how do you catalyze capacity in seed community development financial institutions to make those loans or even invest, uh, like invest Detroit Ventures in companies that can scale? And then also, how do you ensure that um, those organizations that are being activated see themselves as part of a broader network? that they're not trying to be the end-all, be-all to everyone? How do you make sure that they are aware of each other so they can make the system rational for entrepreneurs so that entrepreneurs aren't wasting their time? And everyone knows how to point people to something. So anyway, but that's, that's my take on what's being discussed here. Well, the common theme among the, the four of you is that it's all about interventions and not necessarily small interventions, but, but big ones. And, you know, let's start with kind of Rob and, and Tim. Um, Rob, in particular, you spent a fair amount of time in the paper with Mark talking about why uh, the market can't take care of this. So what is the argument for these kind of large-scale interventions that we're talking about? Why can't we let the market take care of things? The market does take care of it. It just takes care of it overseas. Yeah, I mean, when I worked for, I ran economic policy for a governor, it was a Republican, uh, and uh, it was very clear he believed in the market, he just didn't think the market was going to help, def definitely help his state, and it needed active government policies. Uh, so he, he didn't care about the world, global economy, he didn't frankly care about anybody else's state, he cared about his state. And I think that's how we have to think about this. I guess what I, so if you think about the market, what is the market? It's, it's sort of what businesses do and all that, but the other thing it is, is what is this, you know, 3,000 counties and hundreds and 50 states and all these cities, what are they doing? That's part of the market. And I think what we have to recognize is these places have been doing this for 30 years, 40 years. And we have to recognize it's not working. It just simply isn't working. And the reason it's not working is not because there aren't really great innovative efforts like you're doing in Detroit or you're doing, not that those efforts aren't really innovative and great. They haven't been able to scale. And until we recognize that as the core challenge, we've got to get, you know, we've got to enable places who are doing these wonderful bottom-up innovations, not in a way to tell you what to do. I have no idea how Washington could tell you what to do. Only you guys know that. But you could use a lot more help. And I think that's really the key thing. That's how the mar why the market just simply won't work. A lot of this is a chicken or egg question, too. Um, I think you were talking about... Uh, um, you know, the challenge of skilled software workers or tech workers there. You know, I was talking to a young person the other day who just got their CS degree from a very good school, and I asked him, where are you thinking about going? And he said, Austin, New York, San Francisco, or Boston. That's it. That's it. And I don't think he's all that unusual. And why does he want to go there? Because that's where all the good jobs are. Why are all the good jobs there? Because that's where all the young kids want to go. And so you have to sort of figure out how to break that cycle. So young kids are going to, wait, I think Detroit could be a cool place, or I think Birmingham could be a cool place. You've got to get critical mass, and that requires a big push. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between ineffective strategies and the wrong kinds of strategies. So the question for the panel then is, like, how prescriptive do we want to be about the interventions that ultimately come to the fore? If there is massive federal investment in some way, what kind of strings do we want to attach to this kind of intervention to ensure that growth does go to the right places in the right ways and so we don't have pockets of communities that are still left behind regardless of the money that's being poured into a place? I guess my response to that is I'm more worried about the federal government imposing too many strings rather than too few. Uh, uh, so, you know, the strings I would attach to aid would be Okay, there's a wide variety of things that have been shown to be effective in different places, including investing in skills, customized training, tying, you know, meeting the needs of local employers, uh, investing in uh, helping business advice to small and medium-sized businesses, investing in different types of land development. That's all been shown to be effective. That's a wide range of, a, of appropriate uses. I would maybe have a string that I would require that if a state uh, receives aid for one of its major areas under, the, uh, under some kind of federal block grant, that the state needs to reduce 
its large incentives to large companies in non-distressed areas of the state. Let's put a cap on that and say, you, in look, Wisconsin, you can't throw out all the rules and apply and, and provide this large discretionary incentive to Foxconn that violates all the previous rules of what you've done. Uh, you can't do that. And you need to put a cap on that. So I would try to restrain some of the politically driven um, incentive competition for large companies, which I think does not uh, either – it's not in the interest – it's not actually, I think, in the interest of local areas or states. It's in the political interests of some governors and mayors, but it's not necessarily in the economic interests of states. It's certainly not in the national interest at a time when we're concerned about maybe some companies having too much market power. Um, I guess my thought about this is I think I think Tim is right. I mean, it's you can't be dictatorial and prescriptive, but and you also have to trust the people that are living in these places. You have to uh, enter in in a respectful way. Um, and I also would challenge how we even define innovators and entrepreneurship. I'm personally struggling with that. I think a lot of times we uh, point. No offense, but we point ex just to the R and D at a university. Uh, we're not considering, you know, whether there's been an increase in venture capital in that particular city because there's commercialized innovation that's happening through the entrepreneurs. We're not considering neighborhood innovators. That in Detroit, for example, um, there are people in neighborhoods that are creating solar solutions because Detroit, well, DTE Energy removed the lights from Highland Park for whatever reason. But there's a whole neighborhood group that's developed an innovative solution that has lit Highland Park. But that type of innovator is not categorized the same way as that tech, the tech guy, right, or the scientist at a university. So I would encourage, you know, in the program like this, can we push the definition and the boundaries of who we see as an innovator and entrepreneur? And then how do you enter in in a way where you are leveraging the assets that are already happening? in that place, you know? How do you build on the fact that um, in our case, where Ford now has come back into the city for the first time and active, we activated the Michigan, Michigan Central train station and is bringing a focus on autonomous vehicles and mobility. And now you have U of M, Stephen Ross and Dan Gilbert layering onto that with the U of M Innovation Center coming in. That's added to the other activity that's been happening around tech stars mobility and entrepreneurship that's happening. So how does the state layer in to what's already happening in that place? For some people, it may be mobility and autonomous vehicles. And another area for us of innovation is around food manufacturing. What's happening in terms of how people are manufacturing food in an innovative way? Um, cybersecurity. So all that to say, enter in with respect engage the leaders of the community, build on what's already happening, and stretch the definition of what an entrepreneur and an innovator is in this process, and put the light on the unsung innovators that don't always get the benefit of investment capital, whether it's grant dollars or investor dollars, but are actually innovating to solve immediate problems. And I would totally agree with that. At, at UAB, a couple of years ago, we went through a new strategic planning process. Um, and we added to our traditional pillars of our strategic plan, which is uh, teaching and research, we added innovation and economic development as well as community engagement. And so those things drive a lot of what we do at UAB. A lot of the research that we do is founded on community-based participatory research, where when we're writing the grant proposal, we're identifying neighborhood leaders, neighborhood associations, nonprofits, to be a co-author and a co-investigator on those grants so that when the funding comes in, some of that funding actually goes into the hands of the people who are addressing those issues uh, head on. At UAB, we actually have a Community Health Innovation Award program where we set aside funding for people in the community who are developing innovative ideas to tackle some type of health-related issue in their community, whether it's blight, whether it's the built environment, whether it's physical activity, uh, addressing food deserts. All of those things we see as being a part of health 
but we also see it as part of innovation. So it would be great for every innovation to be a high-tech, high-growth startup. We know that that's not going to be the case. But I, I agree with Pam is that we need to expand what we think about with innovation. And so when we, going back to the university, a lot of ways that the university can support those things is you know, through our supply chains, giving contracts to the local companies, whether they are a high-tech startup or even just a small business, prioritizing and giving opportunities for folks in those communities to uh, get the capital they need to be able to launch and grow their companies. And so the university can be um, a catalyst for that. And, and I, I agree, we don't want the federal government coming in and telling us or constraining what types of industries we need to be supporting and things like that. We, we know. We've Listen, we've done all the plans. We've done all the research. We know exactly what needs to be done. Just having that additional funding, I think, would provide an accelerant to the initiatives that we already have going in our community. Can I say, <coughs> with all due respect, <coughs> I don't agree with that uh, because what we're talking about here is, and I get it, and I worked at a state level, and we didn't want anybody to tell us what to do. We just wanted them to give us money. I'm sorry, that doesn't, that's not the partnership. I think one of the big motivators, if something like this is going to happen, the principal motivator is how can the federal, how can the United States beat China technologically, both for an economic and national security rationale. When you listen to, for example, Senator Schumer has proposed a massive investment, totally fantastic idea, in $100 billion in a year in AI and robotics and all that stuff. I think one of the things we could do with that kind of commitment is to target it to places. But the key has to be, you got to pick one of these areas that is important to the U.S. going forward economically. And I'm sure you could do that. But I don't think it's one of those things where we can just say, oh yeah, whatever the locals want, they can do it. I think, but, but I think there can be an alignment between what are key national priorities and what are local capabilities. Healthcare innovation is a national priority. Autonomous systems, uh, batteries, those are all national priorities. So I don't think it's a conflict, but I think it's better to think about it as a partnership. Well, the devil's in the details, but I would be shocked if any federal grant program ever just handed out money without any requirements. So I'm more worried about adding on too many requirements than too few. So. But I, I, I don't think it should be anything goes, but I think it needs to be pretty flexible to, and responsive to local needs. Well, part of the issue we're dancing around here is the behavior of large companies. They have been extremely influential, right, in who is a growth center and who is not, who is a superstar city, who is not. Do we continue to think of large companies as essentially amoral actors that are pursuing their best interests, or are we at the point now that we demand more from the private sector in terms of where they go, how they grow, what they owe their communities. Or maybe do we try to strengthen smaller and medium-sized businesses through our policies, which in many of the most effective job creation strategies are really interventions that deal with market failures that most acutely affect the small and medium-sized business mm -hmm. sector. So when you talk about customized job training, why, why do you need to have the government involved in skills training? Well, one reason is for smaller and medium-sized companies, they really can't afford to have their own training program. They don't have the dedicated training staff. They don't necessarily, uh, they're worried their workers will leave if they train them. So you definitely need to have a government role to provide the training. General Motors doesn't need customized job training. So, you know, it, it, so same with manufacturing extension. The, the large manufacturers don't need that help in identifying new markets, improving their technology, but the small and medium-sized manufacturers can use that kind of thing. So I think we need to think about the most effective local strategies, which frequently will do a lot with small and medium-sized businesses and try to strengthen that sector. And then we need to restrict some of these incentives that are, we, we, we do something because it's easy and politically attractive. We give out a large cash grant to Amazon because that's easy, it will get headlines, it gets media attention. I've never had a reporter call me up and say, I want you to tell me about what manufacturing extension is doing or how customized job training can help small and medium-sized businesses. They're always calling me up to ask, well, what do you think about this latest development with Foxconn? What do you think about this latest thing with Amazon? That's, I, all the phone calls I get from reporters are about that. So, again, I have to disagree with Tim here. Uh, not surprising, Ann, as you would imagine, given that, as you know, Mike Lind and I wrote a book last year for MIT Press called Big is Beautiful, Debunking the Myth of Small Business. Read the book. Actually, I don't care if you read the book. I just want you to buy the book. Um, there you have it. 
<laughs> but look, seriously, the, the idea that we can somehow be competitive globally with a bunch of small companies is just, it can't be done. You have to have large anchor companies. You look at the auto supply sector, auto sector. Michigan, yeah, they have the, they have the tier one, they have the, the big three uh, and the tier ones, but they have tier twos, tier threes, tier four. The other key point here, you, know, you look at all the data, it's all government data, we didn't make this up. Uh, small businesses pay less than big businesses. They hire, they injure their workers more. They have less, fewer benefits. They hire fewer minorities. Uh, they hire fewer veterans. They spend less on R&D. They export less. They have lower productivity. They have more cyber risk and cyber theft. I mean, you just name it. Every single one, small business on average, is performing worse than big business. That doesn't mean that we should be handing out massive subsidies to relocate companies. I, I mean, I've been against that for 40 years. But that I think saying somehow that you can build vibrant economies only focusing on small businesses is, is, is not accurate. Yeah, and I think, I'm, I think I'm in the middle because... This is not an either-or conversation. I mean, this is a and conversation because the way that we see it, I mean, you're exactly right. And it also depends on what you are doing this in service to. So if this is about, so in, in our state, if it was about, in, it, when it's only about industry diversification, right, then there's more of a push on large tech, high tech, life science, et cetera. What we discovered is, though, because you're dealing with, even let's just not talk, don't talk about Detroit. Talk about the state of Michigan, when forty percent of the residents there can't even afford basic needs. It's got to be an and solution. And so, if you're dealing with industry diversification, that's one that solve the problem of raising people's quality of life so they can eat and pay for internet and take care of themselves. You have to assume that those large opportunity industry driven firms don't always have accessible jobs for the majority of your residents. So you have to do it all. And the other thing is there's this beautiful reinforcing loop between the two because as Birmingham grows and gets the big companies and, and grows their tech sector, those people that are coming are going to need a place to eat. They're going to need a place to get their dry cleaning. They're going to need, and it reinforces each other. So I'm not of the school of pointing which is which. I think that we have to recognize the balance and respect both. Um, and that's what I want to say about that. <laughs> In a few minutes we have remaining, we'd like to open up to questions from the audience. Um, please state your name and affiliation and phrase the question as a question. <laughs> Mostly put back. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Goss. I'm with an organization called the Center for Public Impact. Uh, and our work is focused on unlocking the positive potential of government, particularly at the local level. And that's what I want to ask the panel about. I've heard a lot about what the federal government needs to take into account in order to you know, catalyze these, these growth hubs. But what would you be looking for at the local level, whether it be chief innovation officers, dedicated entrepreneurship offices, whatever it may be, um, to know that at the local level, they're really catalyzing and spurring um, the types of things you'd be looking for. I think it was already referred to uh, in some of the earlier discussion about getting outside of silos. And so there are silos. You want to link the university with the local community. You want to uh, hopefully link the city with the suburbs and the rural communities. I mean, look, this is a local labor market issue. Local labor markets are bigger than the city, or certainly than a neighborhood. So we need to figure out, I mean, one of the problems we have in the US is the way our local governments are structured is frequently not optimal from the point of view of making local labor markets work. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to somehow, as local leaderships, work to overcome those silos that both uh, separate uh, economic development from workforce development. They, they tend to still operate totally separately. They shouldn't. I mean, you know. Workforce development should be tied to what jobs are needed, and, and when you create jobs, you should be tied to, tied to what skills are available in the local labor market. I mean, this, this makes sense. The labor supply and labor demand, they're, they're part of the same market. They need to be linked. 
So we need to get beyond these silos, and it takes creative local leadership because our local governments are not structured, are structured in the siloed way. Rob, do you want to add to that? Well, I, you know, I don't think the issue is should you have a CIO or this or that. I think the issue is much deeper than that, and that's the, by and large virtually, I don't want to say no, but almost no city in the U.S. is really innovative. And they talk a good game, you know, they have, they have chief innovation officers who sit on the side and talk about innovation. And they're not really innovative. So all I would want is, I would want most cities to be half as innovative as Singapore. And we'd be a long way away. I mean, Singapore has a digital twin of the entire city, if you know what digital twins are. Entire digital twin of the entire city. Unbelievable. I mean, fantastic. So I think that's actually one of the points of what Mark and our proposal is, is to win this competition. You've got to commit to the hard political and institutional barriers locally to say, yeah, we're in it for real innovation. We're going to confront the bureaucratic structures we have in our systems and really push them to be innovative. I think that's much more about anything else than having a particular person or a particular office. I, I, w I just want to just quickly build on that. I I think another thing we have to think about in, in our regions is who's going to be there for the long haul. You know, in Birmingham, we used to have a lot of the, uh, the banking industry had their headquarters in Birmingham. We have one left now that's Regions Bank it's because of merger and acquisition, uh, things like that. The administrations in our local counties and cities change every four years or so. But you know who's always going to be there? Your universities and your utility companies. And I think a lot of the partnerships uh, that we're going to see in our regions probably should be centered and anchored around those anchor institutions, which are your universities and your electric, uh, I mean, your utility companies, particularly your electric companies, because they have a vested interest in economic development, and they can provide a level, of, I think, of sustainability that a lot of other institutions cannot. Hi, I'm Fred Altman. I'm retired, so I can come to these sessions. Uh, uh, as far as I can see, there are two separate problems that interface a great deal. One is uh, technological development. How do we stay a world leader? And we're not likely to do that by remaining concentrated. The other problem is getting, uh, getting good employment and benefits nationwide. Uh, yeah, those two things are both important. How do you merge them? Read our report. <laughs> well, I think you need to pursue both. And I, and I think that it, it would be substantively wiser to pursue both. I mean, you know, one is an issue of whether or not we have the right pattern of technological development. Are we involving enough uh, the Detroits of the world, the Birmingham's of the world, the Ann Arbor's of the world? And the other is an issue of how we spread economic opportunity. And those overlap to some extent, but they're not quite the same thing. We have time for one more question. Um, okay, we can start here in this middle row. Thanks. Uh, Mark Johnson from Clemson University. Um, I think one of the strengths of the report you published is actually not that we have a place that has things in place that don't, is that you actually stratified it into five different categories of cities out there. And much of the discussion today has been about developing a policy. Do you think we need actually five policies, and how might each of those policies be different, depending on which kind of area you're in? That's sort of the tension between Tim and our, I think, our conversation is that, uh, you know, in an ideal world, if, you know, Tim and I were czar, we'd have, you know, at least two. Uh, <laughs> We probably have a third for, for rural, like really rural. You'd have to have something specifically for them and, and then, you know, give some crumbs to Silicon Valley so they, they feel good. And, uh... Pam, Ray, do you want to, anything to add to that? Okay. We actually have time for one more question. Um, I'd like to go to the second row here. Hi, I'm Jackie Gerhardt from Epic that you'll hear about in just a second. And my question is, you've said a lot of things about your solutions, but specifically, what does it look like to win for each of you? Does that look like increased market share? Does it look like increased jobs? Is it that six of the 12 cities that you invest in win, or is it that 70% of those companies are successful? What does that look like for each of your communities? That's a great question. Um, 
for for me what it looks like to win in Metro Detroit. I hope I'm going to try to keep this short. <laughs> um, but it's not just about jobs. It's about jobs that are paying at least over $55,000 a year to start that are available to people that live within the city. Right now, there's a spatial mismatch issue because people that live in the Detroit that are working are leaving Detroit to work. Uh, people that are in Detroit working, most of them are coming from out of Detroit to work, and those are the higher paid jobs. So winning would be that the residents of Detroit are actually having access and equipped for jobs that are in proximity to them. Uh, the other win would be that I just feel like a lot of problems are solved when people have income and agency. And so if you can use these strategies to deliver that, I don't care if it's an innovation job or a job that's just giving someone income and agency, and then opportunities to build their own individual wealth so that they can put back into their community, I think that's winning. And winning would also be um, not br br bridging between how we see, I said this before, how do we see innovators and entrepreneurs and not limiting that visual of who they are. So I think for our proposal, it's pretty straightforward. If you read the part of the intro or the executive summary, you note that there is a number there where we identified, Mark's team did this, um, all the high tech industries, the jobs, and it's something, what is it, 93% go to really four places, Silicon Valley is one. So I think the metric would be you put this program in place and after a decade, 40 or 50% of all advanced tech job growth is in the next 10 metros. I think that would be a huge success. That, then you'd have gotten something. I'd, I would view success as being we have huge disparities across local labor markets in the U.S. now in employment to population ratios and in access to good jobs. I would like to simply narrow that those disparities. If we did that, if we increased employment to population ratios in Flint and uh, lots of California, Oregon, Washington, outside of the coastal cities, upstate New York, Appalachia, all those places, it would put upward pressure on wages there. It would provide better job opportunities, and it would be not only fairer for the U.S., but it also would better utilize. Uh, workers throughout the country, not just in a few places. So to me, that's success. I think it's fine to have more high-tech centers, but I think we need more than that if we're going to really have uh, a broader equity across different uh, neighborhoods and communities in the U.S. I think in Birmingham, we see ourselves trying to challenge Atlanta and Nashville to be who's going to be the Silicon Valley of the South. So, uh, so beating our sister cities, I think, would be awesome for us. <laughs> Uh, I see my colleague Rodney Sampson here from Atlanta. If you guys haven't looked at Opportunity Hub, please take a look at Opportunity Hub because they're doing some awesome things around exposing college students, particularly underrepresented, underestimated students to uh, tech and entrepreneurship. But uh, we've been engaged with uh, the Brookings Institution uh, for the past 12, 13 months around rethinking economic development. And that was uh, a partnership that involved the universities, the corporate community, the nonprofit, as well as the elected officials. And I think we finally coalesced around a certain set of goals for our region, particularly around job creation, job preparation, and job access. And it looks like we have broad buy-in across everybody across the fabric of our institution or our city around what are the goals around creating quality jobs, giving access to those quality jobs, particularly those who are under or unemployed in our community, and then providing access to capital and other supports to support our startup ecosystem. So I think we're clear on that. And again, having the resources through which we can implement and execute on that is what we need in Birmingham. Terrific. Thank you. Please join me in giving our panel a hand. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.